Well, before we get started tonight, I always like to do this on the second or third day of camp because I notice something different about tonight than, than the first night. The first night, everybody's all excited. Second night, I notice a few of you, not pointing anyone out, not, not, not going to call anybody out, but some of you, and you know who you are, I look out into the group and I see this right here. Alright, yeah, see some of you, you're just, you, you're, you, you're a little slumped down in your seat and you're like this, you're just. Alright, yeah, you stayed up too late. Some of you even have this redness that is under your eyes right here today for some reason. You have this redness. So uh, we're going to do something to wake your face up, wake your face up. So sit up straight, sit up straight. Okay, hands back in your laps, okay, so you're not bothering your neighbor, hands in your laps, okay. All right, then I need you, we're going to have a little smile, uh, kind of a little smile uh, exercise to wake your face up, okay. Now the first smile is what I call, I fell on the playground and I don't want my friends to see me cry, but, uh, so you're going you're gonna to start with the first cry, like the first smile like this, you're, you, you fell on the playground but you don't want anybody to see you crying, so you've got that smile like this. You know, your chin quivers a little, but you're trying to bring a smile up, but you fell on the playground that hurt and you really can't smile, so you're like this. Okay, all right, so that's the first smile. Second smile is the, um, really? That's what we call it, the really? Someone said something to you and you don't really buy it. Maybe uh, your leader said something and you give them this smile right here, this. Leaders are giggling because they've heard, they've seen that today. You've asked them something and they're like this. You like this. So it's really not a smile, it's more of a smirk, but you like this. Just... Okay. All right, so you got that smile down. All right, here's the next smile. The next smile is, uh, is like this. Take your finger and put it like this right here. All right, now rub, rub it on your pants so make sure it's good and dry. Okay. Then uh, take your finger, hold it like this. Put it right here and dry off your gum. Say like this. It's that smile. It's that beautiful smile. All right. Then your next smile is this. It's what we call the uh, the school picture smile. Okay. So you sit up straight. You lean forward just a little bit with just your head, not your whole body, just your head. You tilt your shoulders to the side. You lean the other way and you get on these right here. You know the Olin Mills picture that turned. All right, you all seen those, you seen those. Are you sitting there like this? Okay, yes. All right, then the next smile is, it's the, it's the, it's the smile, just the normal smile like this. You know, you really don't show any teeth, just kind of like this. Okay, now your next smile is the, I can't wait to see what I got Christmas morning smile. Ear to ear smile like this. All right, so you're all awake, you're all awake now, so sit up straight, hands in your lap, back on the back, seat on the seat, feet towards the floor, hands in your lap, don't bother your neighbor, all right. Now tonight, uh, we're going to tell you, uh, I'm going to tell you another story, I'll tell you another story. You all uh, came up to me today and told me how much you liked last night's story, so I'll tell you another one. I hate swimming pools. <laughs> Oh, no. I know you're not supposed to use the word hate. I know you're not supposed to use the word hate. But the Bible does say there's some things that God hates, so it's a good word. But anyway, uh, I'll just use it like this. I'll say this. Uh, I strongly dislike swimming pools. I dislike them. You see, when I, was, uh, when I was a little younger and my oldest son was your age, he was about 10-ish, Okay, I don't remember the exact year, but when my son, Ethan, my 19-year-old, when he was your age, uh, my mother called, and she had given me, uh, she had bought for us, I should say, she had bought for Ethan, really, uh, she had bought for Ethan a, uh, an above-ground swimming pool, okay, 24-foot above-ground swimming pool. Now, um, 
My mom has worked at Walmart for over 30 years in our, uh, the small town that I grew up in in Louisiana, Oak Grove, okay? If you guys moved to Oak Grove, we would triple the population, okay? So my mom, uh, she called me one afternoon. She said, hey, I bought you a swimming pool. It was on clearance. Got it for $5. Oh, yeah. Y'all remember the $5 Walmart gifts? You used to have those. All right. My mom called. She had gotten us this 24-foot above-ground pool um, at the end, kind of the end of summer, uh, you know, July, August. And so she said, hey, it would look great at your house. And in fact, I think it would look really great uh, off the back deck of your house. You see, when you walk out of our back uh, out of the back of our house, it dropped off straight like this stage right here, just a straight drop off, except it wasn't three or four feet like this. It was like seven or eight feet, okay? So the people who had uh, built the house, they, um, uh, it dropped off that far, and then it sloped away from the house. So we, our house was built kind of on a hill, okay? So the, the house was built here, and then the, the ground behind the house sloped away from it like this, okay? So the people, when they built the house, they built a deck off the back of the house and it came down, okay? So off the back of the house and it came down. Now, my mom said, hey, Clayton, your house is here. The deck off the back of your house is here. It, the swimming pool would look great right at the end of that deck. And you know, uh, my son and I, we got the swimming pool home. We uh, walked outside and we looked over the deck and we realized that if we would cut the railing off just a little bit, if we would cut that railing off that, um, and put that swimming pool right next to it, um, it would be perfect. You could walk out of the back of the house on a hot day like today. You could walk um, and just fall into the swimming pool right off the deck. It was going to be awesome. It was going to be fantastic. So my son and I, we get to work, all right? Now, remember, the house is here and the, the deck and all is here, but the, the land slopes. Now, you can't build a swimming pool on, on a hill like this, right? Because you'd only have a little bit of water right here. So we had to, my son and I, we had to dig down the hill, okay? Now, I wanted a good father-son project, so my son and I dug the hill out with two shovels. Two shovels. Now, the place I lived was very, very sandy, so you would stick your uh, shovel in the dirt, and instead of being hard like this hard Tennessee ground, it was pretty much all sand. So once we got the grass off, you know, it took us an afternoon just to kind of peel the grass off, and then, uh, then it took us, you know, about a week or so to dig the hill down, because we would just work in it on the afternoons a little bit on the weekend. But we dig the hill down. Now, um, by degree, when I went to college, my degree is in civil engineering, okay? Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, that means that I can do mathematics way above my intelligence, okay? I can pencil whip some math, all right? Now, when I, when I looked at the ground that we had flattened off, I got one of our engineering instruments and I looked through it and made sure the ground was perfectly level so that when we built a swimming pool on it, the water would rise up, it would be perfect. Perfect. So we got the ground absolutely ready. We put, uh, we, we took the pool out of the box and we spread all the pieces out on the ground and we looked and Ethan and I did something that I know the ladies, you, you've never done anything like this, but guys, let's listen to your Uncle Clayton for a minute, okay? Just listen to your Uncle Clayton. All right. We, we looked at all the parts that were there, and we decided we didn't need all of them. We decided we didn't need them all. So, yeah, don't get ahead of me yet, okay? We saw certain parts, and we go, you know, we don't need these. And then there was one part that came in the bag that would fold that, guys, you know we didn't need these. Any, any other men want to guess what this was? Sir, you're nodding your head like you know. What do you think it was? The, there you go. The instructions. Of course we didn't need instructions. I am an engineer. Are you kidding me? Instructions? I took those instructions. I wadded them up, tossed them over my shoulder, and then I took some of those parts that I just didn't feel were necessary, and I tossed those over my shoulder as well. I had those in a big pot. 
Now, me and my son, we, uh, we put the pool together. We stood. Now, this wasn't one of those that you see now, you know, that uh, you just uh, inflate the blue ring, and then you hang the water hose over in it, and it just fills up, you know, like a big balloon top. You know, it wasn't those. This was one of the old school ones with the metal wall, okay, a metal wall. They had a top plate on. You had to climb over this ladder to get in it, okay? So this is an old school one. So my son and I, we get the metal wall put up, and then we, um, we're, we're looking at this right here, and we decide, you know what? I, I gave my son an engineering lesson, really is what I did. I said, hey, you know what, Ethan? Um, when the water fills up, the water pressure will push out against those metal walls. And that water pressure will keep the metal walls completely vertical, completely straight. And really, Ethan, there's no need for us to put the safety brackets around it. Because you know what, Ethan? The water pressure will do it just fine. And in theory, that works, as long as there's no outside forces that would act on the swimming pool, okay? Now, that's a key little distinction that I missed, okay, that I overlooked, I chose to ignore. So, we, we build a swimming pool, it gets, uh, it gets up, we hang the water hose in it, and we start filling up the, uh, the swimming pool. Now, we live, in, we live in rural Louisiana, way deep in the south, okay, uh, in Louisiana, and it took forever for this swimming pool to fill up with water. So every afternoon when I would come in from work, my son, he would be waiting at the door and he would ask me, he'd say, hey, Dad, 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 is the pool ready yet? Is the pool ready? And we would walk out to the deck and we would stand over and look at the end of the deck. And we saw the perfectly carved out 24-foot hole that we had dug, sweated to dig. We saw the pool standing perfectly up. We saw the water hose uh, hung over the side, slowly filling it up with water, and it had about this much water in it. And I looked at Ethan and I said, it's not quite ready yet. But see, a neighbor of mine had built a pool at his house, and my neighbor told me that on the pool liner, the little rubber liner that goes around the pool, you need to hold it down with clothespins, okay? Now, you kids probably don't know what a clothespin is, or a clothesline is, all right? So when you get home, uh, Google that. All right, but there were these wooden little clothes pins that we bought. You can still buy. Them. We put them around the top of the pool, and as the pool water would stretch that liner into place, so it fit perfectly around the walls of the pool, so there'd be no wrinkles. We would have to loosen those little um, wooden clothes pins so that the the pool liner would stretch perfectly into place. Day two comes. My son meets me at the door. Hey, Dad, is the pool ready yet? I said, let's go check. We walk out to the deck. We look over the deck. The water's a little deeper. I look and I say, it's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. But just think how fun it's going to be. When we get the pool filled with water, we get the deck built all around the swimming pool, we invite all of our friends over, and we have a party. Hey, it's going to be awesome. There's going to be so much fun at on this new deck when we get finished. We're going to have a blast. And I look at my son and like that little smile exercise we just did, he had that Christmas morning smile like this. He just smiling big, big, big. And then day three comes. And I meet my son at the door. He meets me at the door. And he said, Dad, 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 is the pool ready yet? So I said, let's go check. We ran out to the swimming pool, and I looked over, and the pool is perfect. The water's right at the perfect level, just a few inches from the top. And I look at my son, and I said, guess what? The pool is ready. And his smile went from that Christmas morning smile to, oh, yes, the pool is ready. Oh, yes. He ran inside. He said, Dad, 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 I know we got to put the top on the pool, the little cap on to keep the liner in place, but, but can I go get my floaties and my stuff and jump in the pool while you're finishing up? And I said, yeah. 
Yeah, you can do that. So my son ran inside. He grabbed all his gear. He came back out, and he had that little floaty that went around his waist, you know, with the little animal that had the head up like that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, he had that floaty on, and he had his little rings on, you know, his arms. He was ready to swim. Now, he could swim, but he went ahead and just had all this stuff on. It makes the story better for say. He really didn't have it. It makes the story better for say. You know, so he, he said, hey, Dad, can I get in the pool and play while you're uh, putting the top on? And I said, Sure. So Ethan climbs up on the railing of the swimming pool. It's like three foot above there. And Ethan jumps off into the swimming pool. Woohoo! Splashes in the water. And you can hear him jump in the water like three feet deep. And he's like, oh, Dad, all my hard work is awesome. It was so awesome to see. I know we had to work hard, Dad, but it's so awesome. This pool is great. Now as a dad. I looked at my son bouncing in that water, and I'm on the ground starting to attach the railing. And I did what my son did because I saw my son playing and having a good time. I did what my son did. I looked at my son like like it was Christmas morning. I was like, had a big smile on my face. Heart was smiling. I mean, it was awesome. It was awesome. And then I start putting the railing on, and I see my son. He's just jumping in the swimming pool, going under the water, jumping. Oh, this is awesome. It's awesome, Dad. And then it's a beautiful day like today, but then I hear thunder out. Now, we live in the South, so you know that at any time, a thunderstorm could come up, just boom, all of a sudden, rain for 10 minutes, and then it'd be so much humidity that you feel like you're outside with a wet electric blanket on, high, just, so much humidity. So <coughs> we, um, we start putting the pool on, and I hear that thunder, the liner on my son's plane, I hear the, the thunder, and I look, and I, I said, well, there's not a cloud in the sky. There's not a single cloud in the sky. What on earth could it be? So I just got back to work. You know, I got back to work. I'm, I'm putting the, the pool liner on, and I hear thunder again. This time it's a little closer. So you know the storm was getting closer, and I heard boom. And I thought, that is weird. And I looked, and I thought, where is this thunder coming from? And then my head came down at the pool, and I saw my son just jumping and having a good time in the pool, and I said, oh. I can't wait to get it finished. So I um, keep working, and then I hear the thunder get really loud. I'm boom! And I look, and I thought, what is going on? There is no cloud in the sky. Beautiful, sunshiny day. And I come down, and I look at the swimming pool, and I had undone all of the clips on the swimming pool, and the pool liner, what little bit was flapped over the top, it had fallen on top of the water and was just kind of floating like this. And as Ethan was jumping, and oh, as he would jump, a little bit of that water would squirt from, in, from the pool and go in between the pool liner that was on top and the metal pool wall. Okay? So a little bit of water was just squirting in there. And I noticed that pool liner, instead of floating on top of water, it does this right here, it does this right here. It just starts kind of dipping down like this. Dipping down like this. All right? Now, um... Then I hear one really like Mount Sinai, Mount Carmel clap of thunder from the Lord. I mean, just boom! Okay? Now, how many of you have ever watched a movie from your parents' generation uh, that involves basketball? And, and the reason I ask you that is because those movies from, from your parents. Day, the kids in those movies they always had the tube socks that they pulled up really high, you know. They would come up at least to the knee, and if you were really cool, you had socks that had three rings around them, okay? Yeah, if you were to... If, now, I was never cool enough. I just had like one ring or two, uh, so I wasn't cool to have the three rings. But if you were really cool, you had those long tube socks and had the three rings around them. Now, if you wanted to, uh, if you washed your socks, okay, to, to get the sock and it got in the dryer and it got turned inside out, what you'd have to do is you would have to put your hand all the way in. The sock would come up to like right here. You would grab the toes of the sock and then you would pull it inside out, okay? Yeah, some of you adults are nodding. You understand what I'm talking about. So when I heard that loud, Ooh! I realized 
at that moment, it was not thunder. I realized at that moment that the walls of the swimming pool, those metal walls, those thin metal walls, were vibrating. They were vibrating. And what was happening is, is those walls were vibrating so much and they were making this sound. And I knew that at any moment, the, the pool was fixing to collapse. Okay? And you know how the Bible says... In the blink of an eye. You know how the Bible says that? Your parents would say, in the blink of an eye, something happened. All right. It was as if, when that last thunderclap, it was as if the Lord reached down from heaven, just like you had to do in that tube sock, reached under that swimming pool and did this right here. Just, <laughs> just like that. All 10,000 gallons of water that were in that swimming pool gone that quick. That entire swimming pool, that rubber pool liner that was around there, it just turned inside out. Now remember, where, where was our house built? On a hill. On a hill. So I am looking at my son in the swimming pool right here. When the pool inverted and turned inside out, the next place I'm looking at is here. Ethan is down the hill, a football field away from me. Whoosh! Floating on a balloon filled with 10,000 gallons of water. Whoosh! Just surfing down the hill. And the water is squirting out the back of the balloon just as he just whoosh down the hill. Yes. Now as an adult, as the parent, I am nervous. I run down the hill. Oh, Ethan, Ethan, are you okay? What's going on? Are you all right? Are you all right? You see, I wasn't sure if when he slid out under that pool and with that thin metal, if that metal didn't turn in half and just like cut him in half like a ninja sword. I was like, is he gonna, am I going to go down there and find Ethan's head at one end and his legs on the other? Will Ethan be okay? So I run down the hill. It's kind of like that hill right there going down to the lake that you guys went down to. I was nervous. I was like, oh, Ethan, are you okay? Are you okay? And I look at Ethan. And what do you think Ethan said? Sit up straight. 
Put your hands in your lap. Put your back on the back seat on the seat. Feet towards the floor. Look at your neighbor and say, it's about to get good. All right. So look right up here. John chapter 5, verse 1 says this. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Jews. Now there in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate was a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and it's surrounded by five co uh, covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. All right, let me stop right there. I told you that, that I had a pool party and it was pretty terrible. Jesus had this pool party. All right. Jesus, the Bible says he went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Jews. Okay, that was a that was kind of like a party in those days where they would get together and celebrate some of the things that God had done. So Jesus goes to uh, Jerusalem for this party, and he decides, hey, while I'm here, I'm going to stop at this this pool, this swimming pool. All right. Now people didn't do laps and, and things in it like that. Because the Bible says that all around this swimming pool were people who were blind, lame, and paralyzed. Meaning that they were covered in all kinds of diseases. They had all kinds of illnesses. They had all kinds of ailments. And all of these people used to come and hang out at this swimming pool. Now, I don't know the last time you had a pool party. But when I think of people that I want to come have a pool party at my house, I don't think of inviting people who are sick all the time. I don't think of inviting people who are covered in diseases and sores and, and sick all the time. I don't think about inviting people like that. I think about inviting like my, my closest friends, the people I want to hang out with, the people I want to jump in the pool and celebrate with, people I want to go down the slide with, not people who are blind, lame, and sick. Now let me show you another part of this pool party that gets really yeah. Alright, so listen close. Right here, listen. Listen. Listen at this part. I'm going to tell you something that probably no one has ever shared with you before about this pool party. So look right here. Listen. Now there in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate was a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. Okay? Now this story is most commonly referred to as the Pool of Bethesda. And you just think it's a normal swimming pool just out in the middle of Jerusalem and everybody just come and, and hangs around this pool. But this pool is called uh, the, uh, the Pool of Bethesda, but it's near what gate? The Sheep Gate. Okay. Now, before Jesus came on the scene, when the priests needed to wash or clean an animal, this was the pool that they would take the animal. So any animal that was about to be sacrificed, uh, the, the Jews, the priests would put this animal in there and clean the animal up. How many of you have ever swim in like a dirty, nasty cow pasture pond pool? Okay, don't tell anybody you did that. Put your hand down. It's disgusting. Disgusting. All right? So this is a swimming pool that the priests used to wash the sacrificial animals, animals they were about to kill and slaughter. Right near this gate is where they would take all the bones and the carcasses and the guts and everything for the animals they were going to sacrifice. All right. Mr. Clay, why are you talking about animal guts and stuff like that? All right. This swimming pool is located in the nastiest, stinkiest, Part of the city. It's not a swimming pool like we have out here. It's not a pool like you have out here. The water may not even be blue. The problem is clean. Maybe not a bit. But it's right near there or is where the priests would dump the animal carcasses. So um, if you ever go out into a pasture, you notice that it stinks. Okay, it stinks. That swimming pool has all the, the animal remains at it, so this swimming pool stinks. It stinks pretty bad. And then, not only does the pool surrounding stink, but who's all at the swimming pool party? The blind, the lame, the paralyzed, people who are sick. Now, if, if we were alive in Jesus' day and we were walking around with Jesus, you see, his disciples often tried to tell him, Jesus, don't go near those people. Don't go, near, don't go near them, Jesus. 
I mean, there's something wrong with them. Don't go near them. They one time went through an entire city called Samaria and said, Jesus, let's burn this city to the ground. I mean, they didn't like hanging around people that weren't like them. But Jesus, Jesus decides he's going to where the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed are hanging out. And he's going to where they're hanging out, and it, it doesn't smell real good. And Jesus decides that the place he wants to go for the party in Jerusalem is the swimming pool where the sickest of the sick hang out in the stinkiest of the stinkiest places in Jerusalem. All right, so that's this swimming pool. It's not this swimming pool that we have up the hill right here, okay? It's not that swimming pool at all. It's right, actually right there. All right, so listen in verse 5. One of those who were there had been an, an invalid. He had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned he had been in that condition for a long time, Jesus asked him, Do you want to get well? All right. Now, Jesus asked, Do you want to get well? You see, what would happen is at some point an angel would come down. And the angel would stir the water, okay? And whoever was the first person in the water would get healed, would be healed of whatever illness they had. If they were sick, they were missing a limb, who knows what would happen. If you were the first person in the water when the water got stirred, you were made completely well. Now, this guy had been laying at the pool. He had been sick for 38 years. 38. Okay? That's a long time. That's a long time. That's like three, no, two of you from um, the, how old you'll be when you graduate high school times two. Okay? It won't be any longer than that. High school times two. Okay? This guy had been sick for 38 years, a really long time. And Jesus tiptoes through all the sick people. Like he looked, he, he steps over this guy. Leg all bent up like this. He steps over this person that has sores all up their arm. And if we would have been one of Jesus' disciples, because remember, they didn't like those people, if those were sick. If we would have been one of Jesus' disciples and we saw that guy with a leg like that, we would be like, mm -hmm. Boom. And then the, the sores all up the arm, we'd be like, oh, mm. Jesus. Mm. Oh, Jesus, let's go, let's go. But Jesus tiptoes through all of those people. He tiptoes and he finds one guy, one guy in all of the sick people, one man, one guy. And Jesus asked him a question. He says, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be well? Now, have you ever had somebody ask you a question that you really don't want to answer? You give them that look, that smile number two. You give them that. All right. Jesus tiptoes through all the sick people, all of them. And he leans down to this one guy and he says... Do you, do you want to be made well? Now listen, if Jesus ever asked you a question, he already knows the answer. Okay, he already knows the answer. Did this guy want to be made well? He's been in this condition for 38 years. All right, I've been sick before, but never for 38 years. And Jesus asked him, man, do you want to get made well? And listen to what the guy says. He says, sir... I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone goes down ahead of me. You see, for whatever reason, everyone at this pool knew that something um, magical, something mysterious, something heavenly happened to these waters, and whoever would come in sick would come out well. And the guy tells Jesus, hey, dude, um, I'm just trying to get in the water. I'm just trying to get in because 
I've seen the other people get in and out, and when they go in, they are different when they come out. And I want to get in the water. And Jesus said, do you want to get well? And he's like, yes, I want to get made well. So Jesus said to the man, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now this is amazing. Amazing. The Bible says, in John chapter 5, verse 9, the Bible says, at once... The man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. After 38 years, 38 years, he's sick. He's got some issue. 38 years. And Jesus asked him one question. And he answers. And Jesus just says, pick up your mat and walk. Just pick it up and walk. That's amazing. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who's been healed, It's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who was healed had no idea it was for it, who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Now, here's a question I want to know. Why didn't Jesus? Why didn't Jesus just say, hey, everybody, get your stuff. We leave it. Why didn't he do that? Why didn't Jesus do that? Why didn't he do that? But Jesus said, pick up your mat and walk to one person. You see, my pool party is going to have all my friends there. My pool party is going to be in a cool, awesome place. My pool party is going to be in a safe, clean swimming pool. But Jesus has a pool party, and he goes where there are hurting, sick people. And Jesus leaned down, and he asked the guy one question. Jesus leaned down to this guy, and he said, Do you want to be made well? Do you? Do you want to be made well? You see, that's the question that Jesus asked this guy, and that's the question that Jesus is still asking today. Jesus wants to know if we want to be made well. All right, I'm going to share with you a, a quick little illustration. I'm going to share with you a quick little illustration right here. All right. <clears throat> In this tube right here is one of my family's favorite ways of sharing the gospel, okay? One of our favorite ways, and I'm going to share that with you really quick, all right? So I need you all to sit up straight. Hold your hands out like you're Superman. Hands out like Superman. Straight in front of you. Hands out like Superman, okay? Hands out like Superman. Turn your hands over like this. Bring your hands under. Put them under your chin like this. Bring your elbows out. Put them in like this. Lean down on your knees. Pay very close attention, okay? Pay very close attention. Inside this pool noodle right here is my favorite way of sharing the gospel. You see, inside this pool noodle is this little device that is a laser. It's a laser. Okay, really cool laser. All right. Now, before we go any further, uh, I'll tell you that the reason we use this is because the Bible says Jesus is the light of the world, that he's the light of the world. And this is the strongest light that I could get, and uh, it's going to represent Jesus tonight. But before we go any further, I need all the guys especially. Ladies, you can pay attention too, but all the men, if you would, men, I need you to pay yes, you are. Right. Right. I need you all to pay very close attention, men, okay? Look right here. Because men, this is the answer. I don't care how old you are. This is the answer to your question, men, okay, before we get into the serious stuff. This is the answer to your question, okay? Just repeat after me, guys. Repeat after me. AlibabaExpress.com. AlibabaExpress.com. AlibabaExpress. You're not repeating. AlibabaExpress.com. AlibabaExpress.com. That's right, guys. That's the answer to your question. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus, Jesus is the light of this world. You see, Jesus was also visited one night by a man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus kind of wanted to know the same thing that Jesus asked the sick guy, and, and, Jesus, and Nicodemus came and said, Hey, Jesus, what must a man do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told Nicodemus, Hey, Nicodemus, 
Light has come into the world. But there's a problem, Nicodemus. You see, while light has come into the world, you see, Jesus said that people are sick. Kind of sick, just like the man at the pool. But this sickness isn't a physical sickness. Jesus told this guy that our hearts are evil. Jesus said our deeds are evil, meaning that our hearts, our heart is stone towards the things of God. Our hearts are filled with sin. Now, some of us have reasons for why we won't accept Christ as our Savior. And one of those reasons is we look around this world and we see no love. And we say, how can there be a God of love when even those closest to me don't love me? I mean, if, if John 3.16 is true, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but would have eternal life, if, if that verse is true, if God so loved the world, then why do my parents not love me like they should? Why do my friends at school not love me like they should? Why do my teachers not love me like they should? Maybe that's you. Maybe it's not. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're here and you're saying, you know what? I don't have the people in my life love me the way they should. And so when someone shares Jesus with you, that God loved you so much, that he allowed his one and only son, Jesus, to come to earth, to wade amongst all the sick people, just like the guy at the pool. God loved you so much that he was willing to send his one and only son, Jesus, as the light of this world, so that whoever believes in him would perish but have eternal life. But when your heart is hard to stone because you've never experienced love, you see, it makes it very difficult for you to accept that Jesus is that same. Now, some of us, our heart is not hard as stone because we've not experienced uh, the love that we should. We look around this world and we don't want to accept Jesus as our Savior because we look around and all we see is bad stuff that happens. We see people's homes get destroyed. We have our friends and our classmates move away. We have people that we love fight and argue all the time. And we say, God, why is there so much bad stuff in the world? Why are there wars? Why are there natural disasters? Why does bad stuff happen? Maybe that's you. Maybe you're here tonight and, and you look around this world and, and what you see is kind of what Jesus saw that day at the swimming pool. All you see is bad stuff. People who are sick. People who are hurting. People who are in need. And you say, how can there be a God of love when so much bad stuff happens? I mean, if God loved everyone, bad stuff wouldn't happen. So when your heart has grown hard as stone towards God because all you've experienced and seen in this world is bad stuff, when someone shares with you that Jesus is the light of this world, it makes it very difficult for you to accept Him. Now, this last heart represents the heart of stone that I have. It represents the heart of stone that I have. Because, you see, my heart had grown hard uh, towards the things of God uh, because I didn't grow up going to church. I didn't get to go to church as a kid. My family never really went. And so um, when I uh, grew up, I grew up with a hard heart towards God because I wanted to do life my way. It was my way or the highway. No one would tell me what I could or couldn't do. No one was going to tell me what was right or wrong. It was my way or the highway. A lot of, uh, a lot of us are like that. A lot of us say, I don't care what my parents say. No one's going to tell me what I can or can't do. Oh, you may make me obey today, but in my heart, I'm disobeying. Or maybe your teachers try to get you to do something, and you say, mm -mm, I may do it right now, but in my heart is my way or the highway. You may make me do it now, but your heart is really hard, and, and it's my way or the highway. A lot of us are like that. So if we're honest, when this person right here hears that God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have eternal life, if you were like I was for so many years before I came to Christ, you just really didn't care what anyone said. But the good news is, 
The good news is that the Bible says that while we were sinners, while we had a heart of stone towards the things of God, while we were sinners, while I was a sinner and you were a sinner, while we were sinners, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God proved what he said in John 3, 16. You see, the Bible says that God proved how much he loved me and how much he loved you. And that while we were yet sinners, while we had a heart of stone towards the things of God, while we were sinners, God proved how much he loved us by allowing his son Jesus to die for us. Now, if this person were honest, they would tell you that they've experienced bad stuff in their life. They have family members just like those people at the swimming pool who are sick, who are hurting, who are in need of someone asking them, do you want to be made well? This person has people like that in their life. This person also has experienced people who um, should love them one way, but they don't. But this person says, you know, there's, there's got to be a more perfect love out there. And this person, if they were really honest, would tell you, you know, I've lived life my way before, and, and there's got to be a better way. So this person hears John 3.16, that God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, as the light of this world, so that whoever believes in him would not perish, would not die with a heart of stone, but would live forever with Christ, or with God in heaven. And this person wants to know more. So this person hears John 3, 17, which is equally important. And John 3, 17 says this, says that Jesus, the light of this world, Jesus, the light of this world, he came into this world not to destroy it, but to save it. Hey, hey, wait, 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 wait. Hey, shh. Don't, don't, get, don't get confused. It was just a red balloon inside a black balloon inside a clear balloon. Okay? That's all it was. Don't let, don't let that little balloon popping make you miss this point. That that same Jesus who waited through a crowd of sick people, he waited through all the sick people to find one person. Jesus waited through everyone who the world looked at and said, I'm not going near you. Jesus loved one person enough to risk everything and come and ask him one question. Do you want to be made well? And you see, that's the question Jesus is asking still today. Jesus is asking you that right now. Jesus is asking you that question through me right now. He's asking you, do you want to be made well? Now, I don't know what kind of uh, pain and suffering you're going through. I don't know what kind of sin you have in your life. Um, I don't know what kind of things that you struggle with. I don't know what your family life is like, but here's what I want you to know. All eyes up here. God loves you so much that he was willing to send his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth to wade through all the sick people just for you. God loves you so much that he wanted, uh, he would have sent Christ if it was only you. God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die for my sin and to die for your sin. Now I'll be very honest with you. If a crowd, uh, if a fire were to break out in this crowd right here tonight, if there was a fire, I believe that I would do everything within my power. I would do everything within my power to try to get as many of you out of this room to safety as I could. I would do everything within my power to try to get as many of you to safety as I could. But not until my daughter Maddie and my son Charlie are safe. Because you see, as much as I love you guys, hey, hey, don't worry about where they're at. As much as I love you guys and would gladly give my life for your life, I don't think I'm strong enough to give Maddie and Charlie's life for your life. 
I just don't think I could. But God loved you so much that he allowed his one and only son. God loved you so much that he allowed his only son to die for you. So Jesus is asking you a question. Do you want to be made well? So if you would, everyone in the room, please bow your head and close your eyes. No one's talking. No one's looking around. No one's talking. No one's looking around. All heads are bowed and all eyes are closed. I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to um, ask you, if you want to ask Christ to come into your life, you want him to come in, and just as he asked that guy at the swimming pool, do you want to be made well? Jesus is asking you that question right now. And if you want him to come into your life tonight, and to give you a brand new heart, a heart just like we talked about tonight, not that's hard as stone, but a heart that loves the things of God, then I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with us. Now, no eyes are open, all heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. Your friends aren't looking around. Your friends aren't going to laugh or, or point at you. But if you want Jesus to come in and remove your heart of stone and give you a brand new heart, just simply pray a prayer like this from your heart to God. You can just repeat these words after me. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. God, I know I've done things that are wrong. I ask you, God, to remove my heart of stone. Forgive me of my sin. Give me a new heart. A heart that loves and desires the things of God. God, I thank you for loving me so much that you allowed your son Jesus to come into this world to die for me. I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. All right. Now, guys, I want you, uh, one more time, if you would, please bow your head and close your eyes. Please bow your head and close your eyes. Okay, no one's looking around. If you, for the very first time, the very first time tonight, no one's looking around. All heads are bowed, ladies. All eyes are closed. No one's looking around. No one's talking. If you um, ask Christ to come into your life for the very first time, you weren't just saying those words because someone next to you was saying those words. But you ask Christ to come into your life. I'm going to ask you to do something very brave. Your leaders are around the back of the room. Okay? Your leaders are around the back of the room. Um, I want to encourage you to stand up and go walk and talk with your leader in the back. Now, no one's going to make fun of you. No one's going to talk. But if you ask Christ into your life right now, if you're one of those who um, said for the very first time that you were putting your faith and trust in Christ, I want you to stand up and go walk to those. Now, everyone else, you keep your uh, head down, your eyes closed. Um, but no one's talking, no one's looking around. Let's 